Hey, welcome back to 316, a Bible study of Bridgeway Church. My name is Joel Eason. I serve as the senior pastor of Bridgeway, and uh, we're honored that you're with us for this study. Now, hopefully this isn't your first time with us. If it is, we'd love to have you go back and look at a variety of our other studies and uh, even check out our church and our website. Uh, but we have been in a study so far in the book of Matthew, and we're taking this study all the way up to in 2024, up to the weekend of Easter. And uh, so I'm going to go ahead and switch over to where we've been so far because we find ourselves uh, now in um, the final stages of the Sermon on the Mount. In our first time together in this study, we looked at the introduction and about the book of Matthew and some context to it. Uh, and then we dove straight into the genealogy and what that tells us. It's very fascinating uh, when you understand why it's there. Uh, we looked a little bit at Jesus' childhood. Our second time together, uh, we were talking about his baptism um, his time in the wilderness, being tempted by the devil, and then calling of the disciples. And uh, we've spent three times, including this study, uh, three lessons in going through the Sermon on the Mount. He is giving that up in the northern part of the, the region of Galilee, just on the north part of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, if maybe you uh, weren't able to watch our third talk together, I showed photos of the historical locations of uh, the Sermon on the Mount. There's two where uh, people say this most likely was delivered. Um, and today we're going to be in chapter 6 and 7, summarizing those chapters. And uh, then you can see the coming uh, studies through the book of Matthew. But uh, that last one, Passover to Commission, that'll take us all the way into the week of Easter. If you're watching this in 2024. And uh, so we're going to have a fantastic time preparing for that. Now, as we talk about chapter 6 and 7, let me give you just something I showed last week. Just kind of taking those two chapters and giving kind of just some highlight to it. Um, there's a very a lot of very famous portions of Jesus' words and teaching that come from chapter 6 and chapter 7. Uh, we're going to uh, read in chapter 6. This is the section where he's talking about don't let your left hand and right hand know what uh, you're doing. And then he's going to follow that up with prayer and the Lord's Prayer. And um, then we're going to read about uh, this treasure in heaven. Don't store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust they can destroy, but store up for yourself treasure in heaven. And then he's going to give the very famous uh, illustration of worry, and uh, we'll finish that out with verse 33. Uh, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Chapter 7, we're going to see the judging others don't judge one another, and uh, the real famous visual of you're concerned about a speck in a brother's eye, and uh, but you have a plank in your eye. Uh, the ask, the seek, the knock, and I'll explain some of that. The narrow gate, the wide gate, choose the narrow gate. A lot of people choosing wide gate in life, but it leads to destruction. And then he's going to finish with two visuals, and we'll kind of lean in on that. Uh, but before we start reading any of the verses in 6, it's helpful for us to remember kind of this overall theme of the Sermon on the Mount can be kind of leaned on. Uh, from chapter 5, verse 20, when he said, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teacher of the law, you'll certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And uh, we talked extensively about this in our first and second time examining the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, but that word surpasses is a Greek word that actually means to exceed. But interestingly enough, it's not so much about exceeding like numerically. So for instance, you would say that 10 is greater than 8. You would say that 15 is greater than 10. In that context, there's a numeric exceeding. Well, the way this word is kind of used, it's not a numeric one. It's like an overflow to, to have more that overflows. So 
The problem with the Pharisees was that their righteousness was very behavioral. It wasn't down from the heart. It was very, uh, we, we defined it as hands. They, they worshiped the Lord with their hands, exterior behavior. The Sermon on the Mount is saying your righteousness has got to be coming from the heart, that there's a heart righteousness to the Lord, a softening to the Lord. And um, when you think about that numerical that's easy to get into. So I'll give you an example. Peter will address Jesus one time and say, you know, how many times should we forgive? Because the Pharisees say we should give, forgive three times. And uh, should I forgive up to seven? And Jesus is going to say, no, 70 times seven. Some translations take it as 70 times 70. The, the concept was your forgiveness goes beyond a number. This, this isn't about just exceeding just by one or two steps. Uh, sometimes we can watch somebody else and think my righteousness surpasses theirs because I didn't do what they did or I've been doing something right longer, more years. And that is not what this verse is talking about. This verse is talking about an inner overflow that there's a righteousness to the Lord from the inside and by default that uh, plays out in how we live. And that's what we've talked about from chapter five. Now that's going to take us to chapter six. And uh, he says in verse one, uh, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward from your father in heaven. Now there's something that's interesting here that I think sets us up for chapter six and chapter seven. And that is that there should be a desperate need for humility in our lives. Uh, a righteousness that is attempting to be seen is already off the rails. A righteousness that is being done in order for accolades or applause or people's notification is already off. And that's what the Pharisees were known for is visible demonstration of the righteousness. And Jesus is very clear that there is a reward of righteousness. That is important in this chapter. There is a reward that God wants to give to his people for righteousness. However, it cannot be one that is arrogant in looking for the affirmations and the recognition of other people. There's a subdued humility that is okay with secrecy, righteousness that is secretly given to the Lord. And it's not that we don't have demonstrations, but it is not looking for people's response. And so that's going to carry over into a variety of things. He's going to say, you're going to give. You should, as people of God, you should give, you should pray, you should fast, and you're going to also work to save. And these things should be given entirely to the Lord. So that's the theme of chapter 6. So when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the treats, streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they've received their reward in full. Once you are doing it for the recognition of people, then you will abandon or forsake kind of the recognition of the Lord. So there's a real wisdom that he says here. When you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will, will reward you. Now, is he saying that anytime somebody knows what you've done, that that's a problem? No, it's a heart issue once again. The heart that says, I'm going to give to be recognized. I'm going to give because I want people to look at me and feel like that's a righteous person. Then you've already tipped into the same kind of motivations that the Pharisees tipped into. When you want somebody to um, highlight you versus, you know, there's going to be a quietness to it, a humility to it, a secrecy to it, and um, that you simply want God to be glorified. You want that person, the needy, who is the recipient of generosity to look to God, not to the one who is the distributor. And 
This is important that Jesus said, your father sees when this is done. He sees that interaction. He sees when you entrust what's been given to you and you entrust it to generosity and he will reward it. And it's not just in how you give to the needy. It's also how you talk with him in prayer. So he says, when you pray, because you're going to give to the needy, you should. You're going to pray. You should. He says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. Now, pause here. Is he saying that we can't pray publicly with one another at a restaurant? Is he saying we can't pray publicly in a church service? No, he's not saying any of those things. But once again, in her heart, if the motive is, I'm going to look around and I want people to say, wow, that person's really spiritual or that person is really holy because of how we pray in loud demonstration or lots of eloquent words. Jesus says that is not the ball game whatsoever. He says, I tell you the truth. They've received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your father who's unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So there's a big component of the Sermon on the Mount here that has to do with how you come before the Lord and how you engage with people. Now, Something about this, go into your room and close the door. Um, I didn't bring a prayer, you know, shawl or a tallit, as they call it, uh, you know, with me here. But uh, I've heard it said many times or taught that, you know, a, a prayer shawl could be pulled over somebody back in ancient days in the synagogue, could be pulled over their head and they could tuck into it. They could tuck into it, and it's like coming into your room. It was just the idea of, of a privacy with the Lord. It's a beautiful thing when we get to pray publicly with one another, but also understanding that God recognizes, sees, and hears the inner, the quiet, the secret, the alone prayer, and understanding what's going to follow this is in verse 7, he's going to say that uh, we're not heard by the Lord because of the quantity of our words. And you could also insert the eloquence. You don't have to have tons and tons of words and eloquence for God to hear you. Now, he is not saying don't spend time in prayer. He's just saying that you and I going on, the word that gets used, babbling, us babbling on and on and on and on, thinking that God will hear us because of the eloquence or the quantity is inaccurate. So he says to them, this then is how you should pray in verse 9, and he gives the famous Lord's Prayer outline. Uh, I'm not going to take the time to go through that uh, in this study because that would kind of expire all our time. We'd have to stop at each one, but it's more of an outline when he's saying, this is how you should pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. How do we come into this place of worship? Uh, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How do we surrender? Give us this day our daily bread. How do we understand God's provision? It'll go into forgiveness. It'll go into standing in the midst of temptation. And he's teaching them how to pray and spend time with the Lord. What will follow that in verses 16 and 18 is he'll talk about fasting in the same kind of context that we've seen so far about don't do things in order to be noticed. So he's going to say when you're fasting, I mean, clean your face, dress up like normal, continue on. You do not have to give uh, kind of, uh, oh, I'm fasting, you know, kind of despondent, desperate look to yourself. Anytime we take righteousness and want to exhibit it to other people for their um, applause then we've tipped into the kind of righteousness that Jesus is accusing the Pharisees. And it means we've stepped away from a pure, humble righteousness of heart. 
understand God sees you when you give to the needy. He understands when you pray. He understands and sees when you fast. And he will reward it. But let it be done with humility. So you have this humility, this secrecy, and God rewarding that. Now, he's going to kind of lean this into how we handle provisions, and that ultimately will go into how we trust the Lord for things. Um, he's going to say, don't store up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Now, let me say this. He is not uh, downplaying or um, uh, criticizing savings, people who have a savings account, people who have an IRA account, people who have a retirement account. That is not what he is depicting here. This is all about trust, and you'll see this in the next section, I think. Trusting that your life, your future, your days, your present and your future are in the hands of the Lord. So Jesus will give other illustrations of a man who built bigger barns because he wasn't rich toward God and he wasn't rich towards other people and it ends up becoming his own folly. It's the idea with understanding whatever the Lord has given you, entrusted to you, this belongs to him and my trust is in him, not in this stuff that I have today. So can we have a savings account? Absolutely. The Bible is very clear about storing and having savings and passing on and um, what it is depicting here is the confidence. Have your confidence. Why? Because your heart is going to go where your confidence is. And if your confidence is in your treasure, your heart is going to go in that direction. So he's going to depict, put that in the Lord. So he says, uh, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Um, what follows is an interesting visual, and he has not left finances in the heart context of finances when he says the next verses. He says in verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, let me lean on something real quick here. So... Uh, this was a real common kind of visual in their day and age. To be a generous person was to have a good eye. To be a stingy, um, not generous person was to have a bad eye. So when he's talking about good eye and bad eye, he is not talking about what kind of vision they had, measurement like 2020, 2010, 2040, or any of that. He's talking about are they generous? If somebody is generous, a good eye, that was a common understanding in their day, then their life will be full of light. And the person who is stingy has a, has a bad eye, their life is going to be full of darkness. Now, I think most of us have watched this in different parallels of somebody who is very giving, very generous to people, and it's like there's a joy, there's a life, a light to their life. And then we've also probably watched or observed somebody who is maybe a little more stingy in pursuit of their own glory, attaining what they attain, guarding what they attain. Mine is mine. Um, and they typically have a little bit of darkness in their life or maybe a lot of darkness in their life. There's, there's not a joy there. Sometimes non-givers look at givers like, what are you thinking with giving away so much? And yet the giver to other people is often like, it's a joy. Like that's not lip service. It truly is a joy to be able to bless and help. And uh, so that's this idea of good eye, bad eye. What follows that in verse 25 through 32 is he's going to come back to it. And he's going to say this very famous part about you can't serve two masters. You're going to love one or hate the other. So you can't love and serve both God and money. So this is a whole depiction about putting entire trust in the Lord. Now, all of that is then going to go into needs and provisions. And in needs and provisions, 
he's going to say, so then don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, and what you're going to wear, and all of this componentry. Now think about, pause. Because what we're going to eat, what we're going to wear, what we're going to have, what, what we have material-wise, provisions, those are natural causes for anxieties. Most people have anxieties that rise around their bills, anxieties that rise around uh, providing for their family, anxieties that rise around work. And Jesus is saying, once again, continue in your heart to understand all of it's from the Lord. He sees you. He sees you when you give to the poor. He sees you when you pray. He sees you when you fast. He sees these things when you entrust your materials to him. And he says, so don't worry about it. And he's going to use two visuals. He's going to use the visual of the birds of the air. They don't sow. They don't reap. But God takes care of them. He's going to say, the lilies of the field. Like, they're more beautiful than even Solomon in all his glory. So he's just given two visuals. God understands the birds need provision. He understands uh, the beauty that's surrounding uh, that which grows that he gives life to. And uh, he says, so don't worry about these things. And um, he's going to lean on that even your worry won't even change the quality of one hour of your life. That's a fascinating concept. Not even one hour that will change in your life. And so then you have this very famous verse that follows all this. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Now, as chapter 6 is ending, I just want to highlight this concept of live with confidence in God. So, so far, please try and track with me here. Remember the disciples followed Jesus and heard the Sermon on the Mount in Galilee, northern part of the Sea of Galilee. It would also eventually end up in Jerusalem, and that's where the church would be growing, following the res resurrection they were there Jesus had said don't leave Jerusalem but wait until you receive power the church begins to grow rapidly 3,000 are saved in the day of Pentecost and uh, then there's a persecution that breaks out in chapter 7 of the book of Acts against Stephen and the church disbands and travels north ends up in Antioch we talked about that in our first look at Matthew 5 and uh, and Matthew is writing this gospel somewhere between 55 and 65 AD. And you think about the transfer of time from Galilee when they first heard it to Jerusalem where they were living it a few years later, or probably about two years later, to Antioch now more than 20 years later and Matthew is writing and recording the gospel and people are having to live this people are in Antioch Jewish people who were the, the focus of the book of Matthew initially are in Antioch not in Jerusalem not in Israel and they probably were concerned about their provisions they were concerned about what they were going to eat they were concerned about what they were going to wear. They were concerned about their lives. And they were concerned about taking care of one another. The Sermon on the Mount so powerfully because you have this when Jesus is giving it. And then you also have this component, if you put on a scholarly hat, of when Matthew is writing it. And how people would have had to live it out. It's as applicable for you and me hearing it in our present day when we read the Sermon on the Mount. It's as powerful for us today also because how do we pray? How do we give to the needy? How do we fast? How do we trust the Lord with our resources and provisions? How do we make sure that we have a righteousness that's coming from the depth of our heart and that we're doing verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? 
Let your righteousness surpass that of the, the Pharisees, not just a tangible hand righteousness, but a heart righteousness that understands God sees you and he will reward you. Now, if we get ready to go into chapter 7, um, we want to remember so far the Sermon on the Mount has gone through the Beatitudes. It started off with blessed are the pure in heart, meaning a true dependence on the Lord. It'll go all the way in the Beatitudes to blessed are those who, uh, blessed are you when you're persecuted. And, and then he's going to go from that to your salt of the earth, your light in the world. So be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. And then he's going to eventually go to this component of how do you carry out the law? You've heard it said, don't murder. But I say, if you have this anger in your heart and that progresses, you've heard it said, don't lust, don't commit adultery. But I tell you, if the lust is in your heart. Jesus is helping them live an inner righteousness. From that teaching on the law, then he comes into what we've discussed so far with chapter 6. And now he's going to be going into chapter 7, still continuing with humility. And uh, he says, so don't judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you'll be judged. And with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. And uh, so what follows this is that famous parallel or parable of, so let's say, for instance, you want to pull the speck out of somebody's eye, but you have a plank in your eye. And that whole component was meant for a bit of humor. It would have been heard as a bit humorous, imagining somebody has a two by four coming out of their eyeball. You know, it once again, the eye representing how we see things. If you have a good eye, if you have a bad eye. If you're trying to strain out somebody's sin, but you have an inner an inner unrighteousness, he's like, he's trying to push them towards a humility and a, 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 a softness in our heart towards the Lord and towards other people. And um, so, and one of that is in how we view other people, how we criticize, how we judge, how we're skeptical of them. Let righteousness be on the inside, a softening on the inside, so there's not a condemning. Because if I tell you, if righteousness only stays at our hands, we will be the first to throw stones. The Pharisees had righteousness on the hands and not in the heart, and they were ready to throw stones. When righteousness is down deep in the heart, then there's a humility that comes with that. There's a understanding that all of this is in the Lord's hands. Now, this is an interesting thing that follows here. He says, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to the pigs. If you do, they may trample under their feet and, and then turn and tear you to pieces. Um, so uh, that word heros, um, that C is silent. And I've heard it enunciated a few different ways. Um, where you have pearls, throw your pearls. Um, there was a practice, uh, and it comes from, um, as Solomon will write about stringing pearls. Stringing pearls. And he'll use uh, the Hebrew word that would have come off of haraz. Um, and it was said that teachers rabbis would string pearls together. What that simply meant was to take portions of the Old Testament teachings and give a portion of it, understanding that the reader or the hearer would be able to fill in the gaps. For instance, I'll give just a simple one. When Jesus is on the cross and he says, Father, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He is quoting from Psalm 22. And it's almost like string in the pearl. It's the understanding that the person would be able to understand the completion of Psalm 22. So if you hear part of it, um, you know, oh, beautiful, we're spacious skies, that you might be able to fill in the rest of, you know, that song of American Beautiful. Uh, if you hear uh, a song come on and you hear one line, you can fill in the rest of the gap. That would be like the concept of stringing pearls. 
And so Jesus would do this regularly where he would take one statement out of a prophet or out of the Torah and then he would keep teaching. And so he's saying, uh, be careful about throwing the scripture to dogs who won't live it, basically. Making sure that it's not, I'm throwing this at other people, I'm living it myself. Now, from that, he's going to go into verse 7. He's going to say, ask and it'll be given to you, seek, you'll find, knock and the door will be opened to you. Whoever uh, for everyone who asks, receives, he who seeks, finds to him who knocks, the door will be open. So there's this invitation from the Lord to come to him. Now, understand that this isn't just always a one time. The Lord can certainly ask or answer in one time. But many times it's a collection of asking, a collection of seeking. There are a number of times that the Lord won't respond just off of one ask. And it's not because he's not gracious. But he invites us into a greater pursuit and into a greater searching, into a greater asking, where it's almost like a collection of asking and a collection of seeking and a collection of knocking. And in that pursuit, because like over in the book of Proverbs, it talks about uh, to pursue wisdom. And it's not just a simple one day, one moment. It's a life pursuit, a searching after wisdom. So you have here Jesus saying, the Father will reward you, but ask and keep asking, seek and keep seeking, knock and keep knocking. And then he gives a visual. If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? What happened between verse 7 and this passage that you see on your screen is he had given an illustration of dads. He's like, okay, so you dads, if your, fa if your son asks for bread, how many of you are going to give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, how many of you are going to give him a snake? And then he says this line, if you then, though you are evil, what does he mean by that? He's saying, you have issues. You're not perfect. You don't have all the provisions. You don't have all the righteousness. You're not perfect. Father God is perfect. And if you know how to give good gifts, how much more does your father know? Once again, this whole concept of righteousness on the heart, understanding humility, secrecy, that I can give to the needy, I can pray, I can fast, I don't need the fanfare of other people, I can be gentle with people, not judging, I can uh, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking to the Lord. He'll provide as he needs and in his time. And so then he goes to this verse 13 and he says, Enter through the narrow gate. Wide is the gate, broad is the road that leads to destruction. Many enter through it, but so all is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. So this is where it'll start to kind of start heading towards close. Um, most people won't want to do it God's way. Most people want to have the accolades of other people. Most people will want to hold on to everything that comes to them. Most people will want to judge one another. Most people will live, according to Matthew 5, uh, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Most people will love those who love them and not hate their enemies. Most people will not choose the narrow gate. Matthew 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, this entire sermon is this depiction, narrow gate living. What is it to trust the Lord? What is it to be have righteousness that's on the inside of the heart and to allow the Lord to help and reward and bless that? And he says, so enter through this narrow gate. He follows that up with watch out for false prophets because you're going to have people that try and shift you. You're going to have people that try and tell you different things. And he says, they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you'll recognize them. And he'll go on to depict more about the fruit, but he is just giving this understanding. You're always going to be able to tell people by their fruit. Uh, the fruit of their humility the fruit of whether that righteousness is on the inside where there's a humility, a secrecy, not a pompous nature to it, not an arrogant nature to it, 
or you'll recognize the righteousness is on their hands and they want everybody to see it, know it, recognize it, applaud it, and uh, they want fanfare. And Jesus is going to say, you'll know the fruit, you'll see it. Um, I could talk a long time about that, about how I've often watched and talk to people about let's just watch the fruit before we judge somebody let's just watch the fruit and uh, that leads us to think about John 15 the one who abides in me will bear much fruit to the father's glory apart from me you can do nothing all of that kind of componentry from John 15 we're called to bear fruit with the Lord we're called to enter the narrow gate we're called to a humility an inner righteousness that's what surpasses the righteousness of the Pharisees who live only on the hands. Um, and then he'll go to, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only he who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, drive out demons, perform many miracles? Uh, then I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. So, that, that verse has scared a lot of people over the years of saying, you know, am I going to get to heaven? And is the Lord going to say, I never knew you? Well, it's, it's intended to be uh, sobering, not scary. Uh, Jesus didn't give that to scare people. He gave it to, for a sobering, you know, kind of awareness, the realities that God recognizes when you are, when you are rejecting him. To only have a hands righteousness, no heart righteousness, no humility before God, no softness on the inside. There is a point that that is rejecting Jesus. That's rejecting his way. And he says, if you continue to reject my word and reject my call and reject me, you might have things on the outside that you say, we did all this. And you say, I never got down into your heart. This verse is not intended to scare somebody like because I've got sin or I'm off at times and I struggle at times and maybe I'm going to get before the Lord and he's going to say, I never knew you. That is not what that statement is intended for. It is not intended to scare the person trying to draw near to the Lord. It is to create a sobering understanding that righteousness can't just be on the outside where you say things about yourself. Righteousness has to get down on the inside. And he's going to say, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine puts them into practice like a wise man built his house on the rock. Rain's going to come down, winds are going to blow, but he is going to stand strong because it had its foundation on the rock. Conversely, Everyone who hears these words of mine does not put them into practice like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Rain came down, steam rose, winds blew, beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. It's this idea, I'm going to let the word of the Lord inside me. So this famous Sermon on the Mount starts with Beatitudes, chapter 5, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This, this not wavering. He's going to talk about these blesseds, the makarios, um, and he's going to take that into your salt of the earth, your light of the world. Let your righteousness get down on the inside where it surpasses that of the Pharisees. And remember, you've heard it said, don't commit murder. But I tell you, if you have hate in your heart, you've heard it said about adultery or you've heard it said about oaths. You've heard it said about uh, your enemies. And he's going to give this let righteousness get deep inside of you. And then in chapter 6, he's going to talk about, so when you're giving to the needy, and when you're praying, and when you're fasting, understand God sees the humility, God sees the secrecy. Let him reward you in his way. So store up all those things in heaven, not in this world. And when you get anxious about your provisions, and you get anxious about your family, and you get anxious about these things, understand like the birds of the air, he's taking care of them. The fields full of flowers and lilies, he takes care of them. And he will take care of you. So seek first his kingdom. And as you're doing that, don't judge others. Be soft in how you uh, handle these things. And uh, don't be so drawn into the speck in people's lives. You know, but um, be humble. 
And as you are, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, understanding that the Lord sees these things and, uh, and enter through that narrow gate. Always look for what's the narrow gate that the Lord would want me to go through. And as you do this, then you're going to be walking in the things of him and you're building your house upon his words and you'll have the fruit that exemplifies that and the Lord says I will reward you and it's with that that uh, the Sermon on the Mount comes to a close it says when Jesus had finished saying these things the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he had taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law and it's with that that he closes out this teaching famously called the Sermon on the Mount I hope this has been a blessing to you. I hope you'll take this word and the study and the reading and take it even further. And I hope you'll join me in the coming week as we're going to take and follow uh, beyond chapter 7. Now we'll be going into chapter 8 and watching Jesus' ministry in the various areas surrounding the Sea of Galilee. With that said, God bless you and I'll see you soon.